I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Durant. Alexander, I'm going to read you a title from our team. Samples taken from Kremlin critic Navalny show no signs of poison, according to doctors. We've had the Scripple case as well, which has been in doubt as to this whole Novichok uh, theory that has been concocted. Uh, we've done many videos on the Scripples and, and the Novichok narrative. Um, that Teresa May herself helped uh, helped spread <laughs> all over the place. And Alexander, we have some news coming out of what I would say is the origins of this whole Russia likes to poison people kind of stuff that we hear in the mainstream media. Alexander, take us into this Russia poisoning people uh, narrative that we hear all the time. Yes, I mean, it's an absolute fiction. And can I say where it first began, in my opinion? And it's interesting that you mentioned this, because, of course, you mentioned this this uh, meme about the Russians secretly poisoning their opponents, um, because the place where it all began was actually Ukraine with the Ukrainian opposition leader, Viktor Yushchenko, who uh, uh, eventually became president of Ukraine and led the Orange Revolution of 2004. And um, he had some kind of severe allergic reaction and his face came up, came out with all sorts of spots. And he came and he claimed that the Russians had tried to poison him. And it's now been admitted, apparently, by the Ukrainian uh, uh, prosecutors and the Ukrainian police, this is at least, you know, 15 years later, that there was no truth to that and that Yushchenko was never poisoned at all. And yet, you know, we we hear about how Litvinenko was poisoned with polonium. We hear how uh, um, supposedly the Skripals were poisoned with this mysterious Novichok. Um, Litvinenko, by the way, was poisoned by polonium, but I did a massive... Uh, um, investigation of that claim. And it turned out there was actually no evidence that that polonium came from Russia or had any connection to Russia. It, that was a finding, by the way, of the British public inquiry, which has never been widely publicized. But there were claims that polonium only comes from Russia and that it's very expensive. And it's now been established that, in fact, neither of those claims were true. It's made in all sorts of places and it's not expensive at all. And then, of course, we have the El Novichok thing with the Skripals. And, you know, we've discussed in many videos how there are fundamental problems with that story. And then a few uh, days ago, we got the story about how uh, 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 Navalny had also supposedly been poisoned after attending this protest that uh, uh, we did a video about just a few days ago. And it turns out that isn't true I either. But for me, the most bizarre story of all is one that has also just appeared just a, just a day or so about a Russian political activist called Kara Murza who is also supposed to have been poisoned and killed by the Kremlin over the last few days. And it was sort of all reported all over the media or at least parts of the media that he had been. And in fact, the man is alive and well. And what happened was that a man called Kara Murza did die. But that person was the uh, political activist's father, who died of natural causes, in other words, from old age. So, you know, we have this meme about the Russians going around poisoning people. When you actually examine the evidence, it never really works out. And as I said, the original story with Yushchenko has been proved to be untrue. This story with Navalny is also, I'm sure, untrue. But of course, it's now a, a meme used by parts of the media and it will never die because it's so attractive it makes the russians seem you know more like you know b bond villains which is what the media wants them to look like alexander going back to the yushchenko poisoning yeah. what what was the damage do you think that this did to russian ukraine relations and, and to the eventual maidan and to everything that we see today i mean some sometimes you know stupid things like this you know, Yushchenko saying that Russia poisoned me can have very 
big and dangerous consequences 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And well, I remember this story as well. And, you know, my mind just goes and it thinks, you know, the bad blood begins with stuff like this. Well, can I just say, in my opinion, there wouldn't have been an Orange Revolution in 2004, and there wouldn't have been a Maidan coup in 2014, and there wouldn't have been a war in the eastern Donbass, and Ukraine would not have been effectively destroyed in the way that it has been, if that story of Yushchenko's poisoning had not been given the attention that he had. D dig into that a little deeper. Why? Yeah, I mean, like, what, how, why? How do you envision this? Because you just laid out a huge chain of events, and that's where my mind is going to. Because, because Yushchenko, in a sense, is the start of all of this. I mean, Ukraine never had a very satisfactory or stable political system after it achieved independence from the Soviet Union. But Yushchenko, uh, what was happening in the early, early 2000s is that the governments of Ukraine at that time was starting to forge increasingly close rate links with, Ru with Russia. Ukraine entered into a free trade zone with Russia, and there seemed every prospect at that time that Ukraine would, in would join the uh, uh, Eurasian economic community, which the Russians were at that time creating, and that it would become an integral part of it. And then what happened was that at around this time, Yushchenko, who had been a you know, not very successful head of the Ukrainian Central Bank and not a very successful prime minister of Ukraine, but uh, uh, um, who was built up by the West as this great reformer who was going to reform Ukraine. They always called these people reformers, though, of course, Yushchenko did very little reforming, actually, but that's another story. Anyway, he was built up like this and as this great fighter of corruption. Um, in fact, what he was, as became clear after he became president, was viscerally and extremely anti-Russian. Anyway, what happened was this man who was languishing in the polls in Ukraine and seemed to be nowhere close to becoming president, suddenly became ill, appeared with his face disfigured, and, of course, this vast story uh, um, uh, was propagated that the Russians had poisoned him at the, with the support of, uh, uh, um, you know, pro-Russian oligarchs in Ukraine to prevent his anti-corruption drive from taking off. And it was this which propelled him uh, to the presidency by giving him a huge tidal wave of sympathy in Ukraine and making him appear the champion of, 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 of the Ukrainian people against the oligarchs and by extension against Russia. And when he became president, it was he who infected, or rather his government, which infected Ukraine with this Maidanist ideology and culture, which came roaring back after Yushchenko himself lost the presidency in 2010, it came roaring back with the color with the uh, Maidan coup in 2014. So this is the story. I, I I don't think any of these things would have happened in the way they did if Yushchenko had not become president as a result of the Orange Revolution in 2004, and he would not have become president if this story of, ha of him having been poisoned by the Russians had not been propagated in the way that it was. And we now know that that story isn't true. So, you know, it, it, it can have an effect. We must not underestimate the influence of these events. Certainly, there were people in Ukraine with ultra-nationalist opinions, who would have been very dangerous anyway. But it was Yushchenko who gave them force, and it was the story that he'd been poisoned by the Russians, which gave, gave him force also. And that's why Ukraine is where it is now. Can you say that 15 years later that Yushchenko was indeed a hoax, the poisoning was a hoax, 
And can you also say, Alexander, that for some reason it seems that now the, especially with the Navalny, yeah. that maybe Russia is starting to catch on to this poisoning tactic that they're using? Because it seems to me that, you know, Navalny right away went to the poisoning trick. Yeah. But right away, mm. Russia and doctors, you know, kind of dispelled that immediately. Maybe yes. to prevent some sort of, like you say, an outpouring of sympathy as a second uh, demonstration approaches in, in a couple of days. So it seems that, and, and of course you could also say that poisoning was used to, to sour um, yeah. UK-Russia relations as well. I yes. mean, two instances. So can you say that Russia is maybe getting a little better in, uh, you know, take, in, 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 in getting, you know, to the story before it's, you know, in, gets in, out of control, uh, getting ahead I of the story? That, I, I think that's probably right. I mean, I have to say, first of all, I, I've no doubt that the Yushchenko poisoning story is untrue. The Ukrainian deputy at, uh, uh, procurator general, uh, uh, who's um, at the moment Ukraine's senior law officer, has said so. And so has apparently the principal police investigator who has been investigating the story. And both of those people, it should be stressed were uh, people appointed to their posts by the former government of uh, uh, the Maidan government of uh, uh, Poroshenko. So, I mean, you know, we're not talking about people who were uh, pro-Russian. I've no doubt that story is false, of Yushchenko having been poisoned. I would add, by the way, that I never really believed it. I mean, I thought there was a chance that he might have been poisoned, but I never took seriously the claim that the Russians did it. And I never really believed that he'd been poisoned either. I mean, people get bad allergic reactions. It's not that unusual. I mean, I've seen it happen. So, I mean, people need to understand that uh, 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 and, and, you know, acknowledge it. But of course, the damage was done. And the media in the West that ran with the story of the Yushchenko poisoning is not, of course, admitting that it has been completely discredited. Now, I think the Russians are getting a bit quicker with this. I mean, they dealt, they, 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 as you said, nipped the Navalny poison story in the, in the, uh, uh, they, very they nipped quick. very, very quickly. Yeah. And I don't think it will gain uh, much traction in Russia, any, any traction in Russia, except amongst that tiny number of people who support Navalny anyway and who are going to believe him irrespective of what he says, however implausible it is. And, of course, in the West, the media will also run with this story for that same reason. I mean, I don't think they're really interested in the truth of it. It's a colourful story and uh, they will run with it. But in Russia itself, I don't think it will have much credibility. I don't think anybody really believes it. There's been a lot of damage in the UK from these poisoning stories, though. I mean, it's, oh, absolutely. you, you well, know, from Scripple to, I mean, it's just, it's just done so much damage. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, over the, the, years. the, lit, the, the Litvinenko. Litvinenko, and, yeah. And, yeah, and Skripal stories have done immense damage. To Russia Anglo was not good in the Russian media and and, and the Kremlin. They, you, they didn't do a good job in getting ahead of those stories. Would you agree with, no. with me there? No, absolutely. I do absolutely agree with that. I mean, they're far too secretive. I mean, the point about the Russians is that they they still have this habit when they're confronted with these allegations of not wanting to say too much about their own intelligence services and what they do. So the result is that all kinds of far-fetched and incredible stories get wind, and they did in this case. I mean, it's not enough, I'm afraid, to say that the British have not produced any evidence, because what people look for is not just, you know, the British producing evidence, they also look to the Russians to produce counter-evidence, which the Russians never really did. I come back to what I said. I don't know the whole truth about the Skripal affair. I don't think anybody does. With the Litvinenko affair, I did investigate it very, very closely indeed. I don't have any doubt that Litvinenko was deliberately poisoned by someone and that he was deliberately poisoned with polonium. And I have no doubt at all that Russian intelligence was not involved.
I mean, I, I, if I, I, I'm going to say. Why, why do you say that? Can, can, can well, you disclose that, or, or why do you say that? No, I, I, I can absolutely disclose it. I, 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 first of all, the two people that the British uh, fingered as being his likely uh, uh, um, murderers, a man called Lugovoy and a man called Kofdun, have no conceivable connection to Russian intelligence. Lugovoy, in the past was involved with the KGB, was, a, was an official of the KGB, but he broke with the KGB long ago, uh, began to work very closely for the Russian exiled oligarch Boris Berezovsky, was known to be loyal to Berezovsky and had served a prison sentence in Russia for springing one of Berezovsky's agents. So, I mean, it's beggar's belief that he would have carried out a mission of that kind for Russian intelligence. And uh, there is compelling evidence from a believable witness, who, by the way, I have met and spoken to and found completely believable, as did the judge who headed the British inquiry, public inquiry, that in the weeks before he was murdered, uh, Litvinenko was actually blackmailing someone. And that, of course, Cave, who was not, by the way, anything to do with the Russian government. And that, of course, was the obvious motive why he was poisoned. And I'm going to say it frankly, I think the person he was probably blackmailing him, I, if I'm sure, was Berezovsky, the oligarch who was uh, uh, funding uh, uh, Litvinenko's lifestyle. In London, the, the guy and who was he, he had a legal case against Abramovich, correct? Absolutely, exactly the same man. And of course, Berezovsky and Litvinenko are known to have had a massive row shortly before Litvinenko was killed. And I come back to what I said: one of the alleged assassins, Andrei Lugovoy, is known to have been very, very close to Berezovsky. So for me, all the facts point to Berezovsky. And I come back to what I said before, the connection, the uh, connection with the polonium that people were making to Russia uh, wasn't true. The judge again accepted that Lugovoy and Kofton, the alleged assassins, could have been given the polonium in Britain. It does not come only from Russia. And so far from it being difficult to get hold of, it's easy to get hold of, and it is relatively cheap. And there's ample evidence that it's been used as an assassination weapon before by various organized crime groups. So a, a, a whole narrative of Russian involvement, intelligence and state involvement was spun which um, I thought had no real evidence behind it, when all the evidence really pointed to Berezovsky, who it seems to me had both uh, uh, a strong motive, in the sense that Lugovoy was, uh, sorry, that Lutvinenko seems to have been blackmailing him, uh, uh, and also the means to do it, and had a very bad reputation in Russia for also for organizing assassinations. I would have had, and this is something I didn't know, by the way, when I looked into the Litvinenko affair, that the person who put together the evidence which implicated Russia and which was apparently persuaded the inquiry judge that Russian intelligence was involved was none other than Christopher Steele <laughs> of Russia <laughs> Game Fame. I mean, that, that by the way, is, is, oh my is, God. Uh, uh, is, is well... Uh, is well established now. So not the kind of person you would rely on in a case like that, it seems to me. So, you know, I, I, I veered a little off topic, perhaps, by talking about Litvinenko at some length. But, I, you know, it is important, I think, because, as I said, it does show how the stories of Russian state involvement in these alleged poisoning cases have really nothing really behind them. I mean, they've got nothing behind them in the Litvinenko case. And um, as I said, we've seen that they have nothing beh behind them in the Yushchenko case. In the, in the Karamurza case, we've had the most preposterous situation of all, because, as I said, that's a case of mistaken identity. The supposed target is alive and well, and his father died of you know, natural causes, in fact, of old age. 
And um, in Navalny's case, as I said, the doctors have said, and there's no reason to disbelieve them, that this allegation simply isn't true and that he wasn't poisoned with anything. Yeah, they got to Navalny quick. Berezovsky uh, killed himself, correct? He committed suicide. Yes, well, he did. I mean, of course, again, you have all kinds of conspiracy theories that uh, uh, the Russian Secret Service somehow murdered him for some undisclosed reason. But in fact, Berezovsky... Um, um, at the end, was a financially ruined man. He was, uh, 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 to all intents and set, uh, purposes, bankrupt. He, uh, things uh, the, the, he had creditors closing in on him. He apparent, well, he's known to have written a desperate letter to Putin, asking to be allowed to go back to Russia, and saying apparently that he would clear up a lot of the messes that he'd created there. And apparently, Putin said no. And that seems to have tipped over, tipped Berezovsky over the edge, and he hanged himself. I mean, that's the story, and that's the one I believe. I mean, or at least I don't know whether he hanged himself, but anyway, he committed suicide. And I personally have no reason to disbelieve that. I know that's what the British authorities think, and that's what I think is true. What an incredible story, and just the fact that Christopher Steele was once again mixed up in it. Well, absolutely. I mean, very few people. What a know small that. world. What a small world. Well, I mean, you know, the, it is all these. It is a small world. I mean, the world of intelligence is quite small. But uh, um, I find out that Christopher Steele had been involved in the Litvinenko affair and that he collated all this evidence, by the way, but, uh, 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 from accounts of Luke Harding's book. So Luke, Luke Harding is, of course, a great admirer of Christopher Steele. And uh, <laughs> uh, he set out, uh, you know, the wonderful role that Christopher Steele played in exposing Russia's involvement in uh, uh, Litvinenko's murder. But of course, um, as I said, I mean, I would looked at the evidence and I don't think Russia was in any way involved in Litvinenko's murder or the actual evidence points in a could point in a completely different direction. But the Russians, as you rightly say, didn't explain it well. Yeah. So Christopher Steele has, has been involved in quite a few hoaxes. Oh, uh, oh absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, another hoax that he was involved, another story that he was involved in, apparently, was that the Russians bribed their way to getting the World Cup, the Football World Cup. In fact, we know that isn't true either. But, you know, Christopher Steele provided his dossier, which uh, uh, claimed otherwise. I mean, I think I think when you know we drill into this, we will find that Christopher Steele's name turns up in all kinds of turns things. up with the scripple poisoning as well. Is it, but, isn't but, that a coincidence? Well, so he was involved well, well, with, the, well, with the one poisoning and then with the other. Well, well, some people are making that connection. Well, he knew he knew scripple. So, he well, knew it Sergei Skripal. It's it's uh, it seems so, but as I said, we haven't got the whole story there. But I, I, I'm going to make a guess, as I said, that, that Christopher Steele is going to turn up uh, uh, in the background, involved in all kinds of things. But you know, we haven't really got to uh, the full uh, story of who Christopher Steele was and what he's been doing over these last couple of years. But I think what we do, I think it'll be quite interesting reading, actually. Yeah, if, if Mueller would have done his job, I think we would have found out a lot about Christopher Steele. Yeah. That's for sure. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> right. Indeed. Alexander Becker is Editor-in-Chief of the Durant. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on the notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we push out a new video. And remember, you can get an audio copy of this video, so follow us on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And please donate to the Durant on PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar. The links are in the description box down below. And please go to the Durant shop and pick up ebooks on Russiagate, on Christopher Steele, who we just talked about. And as you read those ebooks with forwards written by Alexander McCurse, you could be drinking from one of our magic mugs Here or they are. wearing one of our magic shirts with a double-headed eagle that looks east and west. Absolutely. Alexander, 
Absolutely, here it is. And it's also there, also our double-headed eagle. Can I just say something first, Alex, about our two books? Because we spent a lot of time working on them. And uh, the reason is that Russiagate is such a complicated and involved story. And I think a lot of people can get lost in the maze of all this extraordinary gallery of characters. But what, what we do in the first book is obviously there's transcripts of some of our videos. But what we do in our preface is that we set out what that whole thing, what Russiagate was really all about. Russiagate was all about trying to get Hillary Clinton elected by implicating Donald Trump with the Russians. And all sorts of people were involved in trying to achieve that. And unfortunately, the intelligence agencies of the United States went rogue and were involved in it also. And the second book is about the Mueller investigation and about William Barr. And what we show in that book, again, because Mueller can seem a complicated story, really what Mueller was all about was a gigantic distraction to keep the attention away from looking at what the intelligence agencies and the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democrats and parts of the media had been up to during the 2016 election by propagating Ru Russiagate. And it was also partly the agenda to discredit Donald Trump. And then we got finally a real attorney general in the person of William Barr, and he swept it all away. He cleaned it up. So that's what those two books are. And if anybody wants to un understand Russiagate and get to the grips of that overcomplicated story, I would strongly recommend those two books to do it. But how could I write books like that, Alex, if I wasn't drinking tea from fantastic mugs like this? This is Royal Blend Tea from Fortnum and Mason's, first formulated for King Edward VII before the First World War. It's fantastic tea, fantastic mug to be drinking it from, 15 ounces, perfect porcelain, wonderful luster, beautiful to hold, our double-headed eagle there. We've got lots of other mugs like this, like that. We've got this one. This is the one with the Alpha Force. If the Russians really want to... Uh, you know, take out someone. These are the guys <laughs> they do it, and they don't do it. They don't do it secretly. They do it out in the open. That's the that's the Russian way. They do special actions, and you know they're incredibly tough. Uh, and counterterrorism outfit, one of the best in the world, one of the best special forces units in the world. I mean, let's let's be frank about that. They'd have got rid of Obama, Osama, or oh, not Obama, <laughs> Osama, <laughs> Osama bin Laden, bin Laden, every bit as efficiently as the Navy SEALs did. And of course, I'm wearing this fantastic shirt when I do that because it's been a cold, wet day. You often get changeable weather like that in London. So this is the perfect shirt because you can wear it both in fairly hot weather and in cool, wet weather like the, like the sort of weather we're having now. And it's 100% cotton. It's beautiful. It fits magnificently. My wife, I think, has been writing to you saying how great these shirts are. So go to our shop, buy shirts like this, buy mugs like this, buy other shirts, polo shirts, hats, uh, uh, all kinds of amazing things there. Help the Duran by going to our shop, and Alex will now tell you how to do it. Just click on the link in the description box down below. Alexander Mercurius, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care. Mm -hmm.